Hi, it's Jason Gorman with the third in our video series on test-driven development in Python. If you've not seen the first two videos, I highly recommend that you go back and watch those first. Otherwise, some of this is not going to make a lot of sense to you. There will be links in the description below. Um, OK, now the subject of this video is what should we test? And there are three questions we're going to be asking. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is meaningful tests. So we're going to be talking about meaningful tests and the difference between what I call test-driven design and design-driven testing. Um, we're also going to be talking about how writing lists of tests before we start coding can help act as a roadmap and guide us towards writing better tests. Um, and also, we're going to be talking about obvious implementations. What happens when we've written a test, and it will be very easy to just return a hard-coded number, for example, to pass that test. But in actual fact, the implementation is so obvious, maybe we should just write the implementation. So we'll be talking about those three things. Writing meaningful tests, using test lists to guide us, and obvious implementations. The example I'm going to be using is a CD warehouse where customers can buy CDs direct from the warehouse and labels ship them directly to the warehouse. And we have a little requirements description here from which I've done a little bit of upfront design. So I've had a think about this and I thought, well, I think this might be the, the class design that I would need in order to satisfy these requirements. Now, this is fine. Um, no one has ever suggested, not seriously at least, that in test-driven development, we don't think about the design up front. It is good to do a little bit of thinking about design. Having said that, there is a danger here that when we think about a design in too much detail, we can be led into what I call design-driven testing, where we end up thinking, oh, well, we've got a CD class, and it's got, a, it's got a, a get stop count method, so I'll write a test for that. So we're looking at the design and saying, what test would I need to write for this design? Now, that is the wrong way around. That's thinking it the wrong way around. That's the cart leading the horse. Test-driven development, the clue is in the name. We should be coming up with the simplest design that will pass our tests, not thinking about a design and then saying, what test would I need to cover that design? And particularly when people are new to TDD, they often fall down that rabbit hole of doing design-driven testing, of trying to write tests for every constructor and every getter and setter and every design detail of a design that they, they've already got in their head, a preconceived idea of what the design should be. So some of the skill in TDD is in being able to think about the design, but not get too attached to it. It's good to think ahead, don't code ahead, as it were. Um, so we need to be thinking more in terms of not the design, but in terms of useful outcomes. Our test should be based on things the customer wants from the software. The customer doesn't want to get stock count method. It wants to know what the stock count is. Um, it wants to be able to buy a CD. A label wants to be able to ship batches of CDs to the warehouse. Um, so the get stock count method is a consequence of some useful outcome that the customer wants. Um, so we should drive our designs that way around. So what we do instead is we read the requirements and we think about test cases. Test cases, examples are based on these um, use cases, if you like, that we think our software will need to handle. So let's write a list of these test cases, starting with cases for buying a CD. And let's think of the happy path. So there's, there's, there's enough stock for that. And when we've got enough stock, then the, um, the quantity... Um, bought is deducted from the stock. So that is a an outcome. It's not it's not the design. It's something the design has to achieve. Okay. And what if there's insufficient stock? What should we do then? Okay. Well, let's um, we could raise an exception. Say we don't have enough of those. Try again. Um, and let's think about searching for a CD on artist and title. Well, I can think of two cases here. If it's in the catalogue, then we'll return 
the matching CD. But if it's not in the catalog, then, well, we can just return null or nil. I can't remember quite how it works in Python. We'll soon find out. And also, let's think about receiving a batch of CDs from the label. OK, well, simplest case I can think of is one copy or copies of one CD. And those copies are added, or well, CD that's already in the catalog, I should add. We add those copies to the CD. And what about copies of CDs that are not in the catalog? Well, the CD is added. the catalog with those copies and what if it's a batch of multiple CDs then we would um, essentially we would add any uh, missing CD to the catalog add copies to each CD so we're thinking here in terms of useful outcomes. We're not thinking in terms of a design, particularly a detailed design. We're thinking in terms of what has the software got to do? What test cases does it need to handle? And we're going to use this test list, which is a list of meaningful tests. We're going to use this test list to drive the test-driven development process. So it's going to act as our roadmap, starting with the happy path for buying a CD when it's in stock. So we're going to write a failing test for buying a CD that's in stock. I'm using the built-in unit testing framework that comes with Python. Um, so these are tests for buying a CD. Okay. And buying a CD in stock. I'm going to write the assertion first and work backwards. So let's say we start with 10 copies and we're going to buy five. So we're expecting, there's our stock count. Now, this is very, very important. I have decided that I need a way of getting the stock count. I didn't decide that up front. I, I'm doing that in the course of writing the test. Oh, I need a way to get the stock count. So the test is making the decisions about what details in the design we need. So this is driving it the right way around. We may well end up with the same design, um, but importantly, we'll end up with the design that we need to pass this test. So let's imagine that we have our CD. Let's call that class compact disk. And we're going to give it an initial stock of 10. OK, and let's imagine now, well, we need this, this method for getting the stock count. So let's let PyCharm generate that for us. OK, and we're going to buy our CD. And the quantity is going to be five copies. So let's have that auto generated for us. So for sure, the design we're coming up with is very, very similar. We're going to need this constructor as well. So our initial stock. But we don't at this point need any implementation. OK. That's not, <laughs> that is not a Python naming convention. OK. When we run this test, it should, should fail because we don't actually, yeah, we're, we're just doing that. Um, we're returning nothing at the moment. Nothing's happening. 
Okay, so that's the that's the um, the horse leading the car. That's the right way around. That's the test determining the design, not the design determining the test. Um, so this is a meaningful test, and this is a simple design that we can use to pass this test. Now, the third point that I wanted to make in this video is about obvious implementations. Now, the quickest way to pass this test is to just return five from get stop count. Let's do that now. And that passes. And that's absolutely fine. And if you watch the previous videos, we talk about this process called triangulating, which is described in Kent Beck's book, Test Driven Development by Example, link in the description below. And triangulating means we don't just jump in and write a general implementation. We start with the simplest thing that will pass that first test. For example, returning a hard coded literal like here. And then we write another test and then we would generalize. Maybe we would um, do something a bit more specific, like use a variable or a field. And then we would flesh out our design one test case at a time. Now, if what we're implementing is not trivial, it's not obvious, then that's the way I would do it. I would triangulate. I'd say, well, we can just return five and then we'll add another test case. But sometimes the implementation is obvious. And triangulating is just adding more and more test cases for something that is actually very trivial. So the tests aren't necessarily adding any more value. It takes us a lot longer to implement this very simple behavior. And you will find that experienced test-driven developers know when to take those little leaps and say, well, actually, this is simple. Let's just take a little leap here so that we can then get onto something a bit meatier. So in this case, I'm going to just, rather than returning a hard code with five, I'm just going to implement the obvious implementation. So we just need a field. Let's call it stock count. Initial slot should be assigned to it. And we're going to return that. And here we're going to remove the number of copies that we're actually buying. So it's an obvious implementation. So hopefully when I run that, it still passes. But now we take, we've taken a little leap there. And there is a little bit of risk here that we overestimate ourselves or we, we don't realize that it's more complicated than it looks, which is why it's very, very important um, to be able to, if, if you do do that, if you take a too big a leap and end up breaking the code or doing something silly, um, you need to be able to get back pretty easily. So, so version control in TDD is very, very important. But you will often find experienced test-driven developers write considerably fewer tests than less experienced TDDs. So when I'm coaching people in test-driven development and they're new to it, they will do a problem like this and they'll write dozens and dozens and dozens of tests for every little detail and they'll triangulate everything. And then I'll, they'll watch me do it and I'll write maybe seven tests in this case. And they'll go, well, how come you've only written seven tests? Number one, because they're meaningful tests. They're not about the details of the design. They're not about testing every getter and setter and every constructor and every class. They're about testing useful outcomes and letting the design fall out of that naturally, organically. Um, but also, sometimes we will take that little leap. Rather than triangulating through a sequence of test cases, we'll just go, well, this is obvious, and we'll just do it. Because writing more tests for this is not really going to add any value. Um, so there are three things for you to think about. R um, you need to be writing meaningful tests, tests that are about outcomes that your end users actually want. So look through the requirements and think about um, uh, useful behavior. It's good to think about design up front, but don't get too attached to the details of that design. Those need to be driven by the test code. Let the tests decide what you need in terms of and classes and constructors and getters and setters and so on and so forth. Listing tests before you start writing the code can be very useful. Let me just cross these two off now. So as you see, as I cross these two tests out, um, this test list can act as a bit of a roadmap. It's guiding me through this problem. What test do I need to write to implement these features? I may discover more test cases as we go, because remember, the map is not the terrain. But that's absolutely fine. But the discipline there, if you think, oh, but what about this? Or what about that? Is rather than getting lost in the code, of getting distracted from the test that you're working on, just add that new test case to the list. So they're very handy for that purpose. 
and they do force us to think about the problem up front. So they're a nice analysis technique. And then finally, sometimes we don't need to triangulate. We don't need to start by turning a hard-coded body because that is the simplest thing. Um, sometimes the implementation is obvious and we just write the obvious implementation. Okay, so that's video number three. I will see you in video number four.